just wanted to do a quick little video on some things that I had known about before and uh, never really thought about in depth as far as consequences go for actual circuits. I think you'll find it kind of interesting. So this is the original ICO 221 vacuum tube voltmeter that I had purchased with an eye to restore. And, you know, there was a series of videos that we had done that showed the restoration of, of, the, of the VTBM. This is the one that actually got restored initially, and I had kind of eaten some components out of this to get the other meter in good shape. So one thing led to another, and I ended up restoring this one as well. And I ended up hacking together combinations of resistors and series and parallel to get the, the right values and so on and so forth. And cutting to the chase, it, it works and, and it works quite well. And it's, you know, just all, just about as accurate as, as the uh, other VTBM that I did kind of a more careful job on. So that's nice. But in the process of, of checking this out, I got to wondering about the warm up period and how the heat that the vacuum tubes generate affects the stability of the instrument during this warm-up period. So the first thing that I did was uh, measure the temperature inside the body of this VTBM. This unit had come with holes drilled in the top, and I don't think they were drilled in the top for ventilation purposes. In fact, they're drilled directly over the places where the calibration potentiometers are, on the uh, tray inside the meter. But nonetheless, uh, they allow entree for a thermocouple, such as the one I have here, uh, to enter in, in the top. And so I, I did that and I measured how long it took to come up to equilibrium. And the answer is, is it takes more than half an hour before the temperature starts to level out. And the temperature levels out uh, in the 50 degree C range, so it's pretty toasty in there. And if you put your hand on top of it after it's been on for an hour, it's, you know, it's definitely warm. What does that do to the electronics in there? Well, for some of the capacitors, you could imagine that if they get warm, the plates will expand and contract. And since they're wound into an axial geometry, that might affect the value of the capacitance. And I haven't done any calculations to kind of understand whether or not that's likely to be significant. But the thing that I want to look at in this video is the effect on resistors. In order to see how heat affects common resistors like these two, uh, that's pretty easy to do, right? You have a voltmeter, or I'm sorry, an ohmmeter uh, that you can set up across these resistors and you can apply heat. And so that's what I'm going to do here, just to give a short demonstration. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring this into view. We're going to turn it on to ohms. All right. And uh, I'm going to measure the value. It should be a one mega ohm resistor. There we go. And what I have here is a heat shrink tubing heater essentially a, a glorified hairdryer. So I'm just going to heat this up and we're going to watch the value of the resistance as it gets warm. So no big changes yet. And you see that now as it warms up, it's decreasing fairly rapidly. So now we're down to 994. Okay. And then as it cools off, we'll get back up to the previous reading. So as the temperature increases for this resistor, and this is a carbon film resistor, the resistance goes down. So this is said to have a negative temperature coefficient of resistance. But then you can also ask the question, well, what about other types of resistors? Do they behave in the same way? Well, let's just see. Here is a, another one mega ohm resistor. 
this is not a carbon resistor, this is a metal film resistor. So we're going to start out at just north of one mega ohm and apply heat and see what happens. The resistance of this is increasing as the temperature increases. So this resistor is said to have a positive coefficient of temperature resistance. All right, so we have carbon resistors that look like they decrease resistance as the temperature increases, and metal film resistors, uh, at least this one of which, increased resistance as the temperature increased. But we can ask kind of a more quantitative question, which is how exactly does the resistance change when the temperature changes by smaller amounts? I mean, remember, this thing can really blast out the heat. It probably goes up to 300 degrees C or, or more. So let's move this aside, turn it off. And we can ask, you know, we just showed that the resistance is a function of temperature. So R is some function of temperature, R of T. But the question is, is what, what is that function? Okay. And so we might imagine that it's, in general, more complicated, but oftentimes we just take it as a simple linear function. And so we can write it like this, where R of T, or R is a function of temperature, is whatever the resistance is at an initial temperature plus uh, the, the change in temperature times some constant alpha. That alpha is what we call the temperature coefficient of resistance, or TCR. That looks more complicated than a simple straight line, but we can rearrange that. We can rearrange it like this, just doing some, some simple algebra. So we have R at the temperature that we want to know the resistance at, minus the resistance at the initial temperature, equals alpha times the resistance at the initial temperature times the difference in temperature. And if we rewrite these differences in resistance and dif differences in temperature as delta R and delta T, then uh, we can rewrite this as delta R equals alpha R naught, or R at T zero times delta T. All right, and so the thing about this very simple formula is that it allows us to estimate, based on some pretty simple measurements, what this alpha is. So we can just rewrite this as 1 over R sub 0 times delta R over delta T, and that will give us an estimate of this alpha. So uh, notice that the dimensions of alpha are going to be inverse temperature, because the difference in resistance is ohms, and 1 over resistance is 1 over ohms, so the ohms will cancel out, and we're just left with 1 over temperature. All right, so we have everything right here on the bench that we need to measure changes in resistance and changes in temperature. The way I actually did this was I took my little ICO meter here, uh, and I took a couple resistors, and first one was this one, which is a carbon film resistor, which was a uh, one kilo ohm resistor. You see, I put heat shrink tubing on the wires, and because I was interested in what would happen in an actual electronic environment, operating environment, I just slipped it in the, the hole here on top of this VTVM, okay? And then I put the leads that go to an ohmmeter on, like that, okay. And I inserted the type K thermocouple in the hole, just like that, and turn that on. All right, and so there we go. Uh, and then I just simply, you know, turned on the ICO, and I watched and waited, and I waited and I waited, 
and read off the temperature here over here and the resistance over here of that resistor that is now in what is for all intents and purposes a uh, an oven and watched it over the course of half an hour as as this heated up okay through the magic of youtube we're now an hour later and here's the uh here's the numbers so for the carbon film resistor that i just showed you uh, the temperature started off uh, just at uh, room temperature here in my shop is around 23 degrees. And uh, the initial reading uh, on the ohmmeter was 0 0.989 kilo ohms. The resistor didn't change in the range from 23 to 30 degrees C. But when we got to 31 degrees C, it decreased by 10 ohms. Uh, and then by the time we got to 37C, it had decreased again, and so on and so forth. So the final reading was at 48 degrees C. We had uh, 9,850 ohms. Okay. And so when you do the math there, we, uh, we have to evaluate this expression. And that turns out to be negative 225 times 10 to the minus 6 per degree C. And it's customary to state the temperature coefficient of resistance in terms of parts per million per degree C. So this is easy since this is already 10 to the minus 6, which is million. Alpha here that we've estimated to be negative 225 parts per million per degree C. All right. I also did this with an older uh, carbon composition resistor, this one right here, which which I actually ended up cutting out of this. So this had drifted a bit. And I wanted to see if the carbon composition makeup had a uh, significantly different alpha. So I did exactly the same thing. All right, and this is the data that, that I got. So between 25 and 29 degrees C, it didn't change at all. It was 11.73 kilo ohms. Uh, but then it started changing, and I stopped taking data at 45 degrees C, at which point the resistance was 11.66 kilo ohms. Uh, so you can, you know, you can do the calculation, and here you get negative 370 parts per million per degree C. So almost, uh, almost a factor of two higher than the, the carbon film resistor. Now, are these uh, are these numbers reasonable? Uh, the answer is, yeah, they are they are reasonable. Uh, if you look up online or in reference books what the uh, alpha is for just pure carbon, uh, you get about uh, negative 5 times 10 to the 4, uh, which is 500, negative 500 parts per million per degree C. That is absolutely in the ballpark of what we just measured for the carbon composition and the carbon film resistor. To give an idea of how the coefficient changes, you know, the magnitude of it for metals. Alpha for copper is 4 times 10 to the minus 3 per degree C, which works out to be 4,000 parts per million per degree C. And that's positive. The resistance tends to increase when the temperature increases. There you go. Short little video here, uh, mostly just a demonstration to show that, you know, when you design electronics, and particularly in the vacuum tube days when you had a lot of heat going around, you actually had to be cognizant of the changing resistance of the resistors that you used. Uh, remember, this was back in the days when carbon composition were the most common types of resistors, and they have the largest temperature coefficients of the resistors that are common. One notable exception, the precision wire-wound resistors that are in, in the circuit here. Uh, the wire-wound resistors have uh, are, are very stable as a function of temperature. They have alphas that are you know, maybe around 10 instead of in the hundreds. I think this is this is kind of interesting and uh, something that you need to keep in mind when you're designing things that go around uh, things that produce heat. And it's also something you need to keep in mind when you're uh, updating these old instruments because sometimes that change in resistance was something that the engineers had anticipated in the circuit. And so if you replace uh, the uh, components with things that don't change, uh, in the same way as they were designed as a function of temperature, 
that could give rise to, uh, to some instabilities or to some difficulties in calibrating the instruments. I hope you found this interesting. If so, please give it a big thumbs up below. Thanks a lot for watching.